So welcome everybody. Um, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the staff of the National Museum of Bermuda, we are delighted that you can join us for this first presentation in our Tracing Our Roots Routes program. And thanks to the generous annual fund support by our community of donors, individuals, foundations and corporations, and our membership, we're able to present this year-long program free and accessible to all. My name is Lisa Howie, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the National Museum. And we hope that you like this program, like the program so much, and the overall good work of the museum, that you will consider becoming a member or renewing your membership, and also, of course, consider a donation through our website, which is the acronym nmb.bm. We welcome your critical feedback about this uh, program and all of our programs, and in, in this case, we have a survey, a brief survey at the end of the presentation, so please be sure to give us some feedback. Everybody who has registered and has signed on today should have received with their email a reminder today uh, what we describe as the toolkit referencing uh, Kenyatta Berry's uh, family tree toolkit. And if you did not, please make sure you contact us and that we can send that out to you. It will also live on the website and can be found there as well in the Tracing Our Roots uh, category. So this program, Tracing Our Roots Routes, um, is in response to community interest. This past year, the National Museum of Bermuda's genealogy database which has only ever been available to members and students was used more than ever. And it really made it clear to us that people are looking for new ways to connect with their family and with their past. And with this interest of accessibility, we were looking towards, let's create this program and make it open and available to all. Um, and so that we can really help everyone reach that same end in terms of uh, finding out their past and resolving some questions. The key questions that we're uh, driving through this program uh, is where are, where does your story begin and what legacy does it unfold? The program is, as I said, is year long and it includes a series of online presentations, workshops and resources. It also includes an on-site contemporary art exhibit and ultimately will culminate in a crowdsourced project that will be titled Bermuda's Family Scrapbook, an exhibition that will be displayed both online and on the walls of the museum. We hope that you as the participants and for those that you share this with together, that we will be able to build the resources to enable effective and sensitive research methods for both finding and charting family history information. We hope that along the journey, you'll have this great chance to listen to each other's stories for guidance and inspiration, as well as from our panelists, of course, and that we will together develop creative strategies for communi communicating these findings and telling the story. Our ultimate goal is to assist and encourage you to explore, honor, and preserve your family history. So we start now with a two-part workshop. Today's workshop, as it says on the screen, is entitled The Journey of Family Discovery, Tips, Tools, and Strategies. And we will follow up the second part of this in March on the 17th with local experts, Jane Downing from the National Museum of Bermuda, Ellen Jane Hollis from Bermuda National Library and Medellis Lightborn for Bermuda Archives. So I ask that you be patient with us as we get to the next month because I know what's gonna to happen today. There's gonna to be so much excitement. Um, I think that's gonna be drawn from today and I know everyone's gonna be writing to us with questions. We'll do our very best to floor those between now and March. But if you can be patient with us, we would be grateful. About Kenyatta. She's a lovely person, first of all. I gotta say that Kenyatta, I really enjoy getting to know you through this process. And I'm so grateful that you have the time to join us. You are a renowned American genealogist, an author, an attorney, and a television host of PBS's Genealogy Roadshow. And Ms. Barry, she has, um, is going to help us to learn how to interview living relatives, use genealogy methodology, and access US and immigration records for those who left Bermuda for the United States. Ms. Berry has a vast knowledge in the areas of African-American genealogy, enslaved ancestral research, and DNA, which has made her an invaluable go-to source for information from all parts of the world. 
And when we spoke with our, spoke with our friends at the Smithsonian Institute, they said, Kenyatta Berry is who you need to have. So we're delighted to, to have you, delighted that your friends from the Smithsonian Institute will join us in April, and really just uh, excited to work with our community to see how we can go ahead with enriching all of our genealogical research um, and see how we can almost thread our, all li our lives back together again, right? Yeah. It's kind of like a branching out and then a, I think it may be a tightening and coming back too. So without further ado, uh, we welcome you, Ms. Barry, and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction, Lisa. So let me see if I can get my presentation to move. Here we go. So I'm beginning your genealogy journey. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, with genealogy and when we start with genealogy, um, if you've even started to do your genealogy in the past couple of years, over 10 years or 20 years, you often come to a brick wall or you hit a roadblock, as we like to say. So when you think of beginning your genealogy journey and where do you start, you start with yourself and work backwards. And even sometimes when you've been doing this for a number of years, it's important to do that again. So what do I mean by starting with yourself? Think about the information you know about yourself today. Write that down. What do you know about your family members, your parents, your grandparents, um, as well as interviewing folks to help fill in those gaps. So your aunts, your cousins, uncles. I like to say there's always one in every family that has a family secret, that has that family information. The other thing is to also record your interviews. So you're gonna record those interviews on Skype or Zoom or on your smartphone. And when you're recording those interviews, it's really important to ask certain questions. Um, what about childhood family memories or memories of their childhood, excuse me, family stories, uh, questions around family Bibles or pictures or any family recipes. These items are gonna help you fill in the gaps of your family history. As I said, starting with yourself and working backwards and using this information to build out your family tree. One of the things you have in your toolkit is a sample family tree. That's a great way for you to use that to get started with this process. I've also included some questions for you. And those questions are really focused on yourself, kind of your own biog biographical sketch. These are also the same questions that you can use to ask your ancestors, excuse me, your relatives. So the genealogy research process. With the genealogy research process, this is a repeatable process. What you're gonna do is identify what you know about your family. So we've gone through that. What do I know so far? Starting with yourself, interviewing your relatives, any family stories, the family recipes, the family Bible, and using that to then decide what do you wanna learn about your family? You know, I often ask people, why are you doing this? Why are you interested in your family history? Why are you interested in your genealogy? And this is really the point in the process where you answer that question, or at least try to answer that question. And we often start when we're doing our genealogy, we want to know everything, right? One of the biggest questions I always get, or when I get a client request, is to trace me as far back as possible, or take me back to Africa. And that's typically not an easy task, to say the least, but I want you to be focused right? Because when you're starting this process, it's very overwhelming. So decide what you want to learn about your family history and why are you doing this? Do you have that family secret? Do you have that family story that you're looking for? On Genealogy Roadshow, all of the guests on the show were required to submit, I believe it was about three questions. And of those three questions, we couldn't answer them all because we had a short period of time. But it was really important for us to focus. And so as you go through this genealogy research process, remember, you're going to repeat this process over and over again. So when you decide what you want to learn about your family, then your next step is to select the records. 
that you want to search. So we're just gonna delve a little bit today into immigration and naturalization records, right? So if you wanna find out why your ancestor immigrated to United States, this, this is the record set that you would use. Once you identify those records, then you wanna find and access them. Those records could be available online as well as in local repositories. Once you find the records, you access the records and you analyze the records, you use that information to help you build out your family tree. What that really means is now you've taken what you started with, right? What I know today, you've gone through this process, you've used that information to build out your family tree, and now you're on to the next question. What else do I wanna know about my family? So as I said, it's a repeatable process. This is sort of the always remember slide. Um, one of the things that you will hear every genealogist say, whether they're a beginning genealogist, they're intermediate, they've been doing it for 35 years, is to always cite your sources. This is a thing that most beginning genealogists make the mistake of not doing. And that is, you talk to an aunt, you talk to an uncle, and you get that information from them. You do those interviews that I talk about. You look at the family Bible, the family recipes, and you forget how you got that information, who gave you that information. And 10 years later, five years later, even three years later, you're wondering who is this person that told me this information? Is it credible, right? Is it that, uh, that you know, kind of embellishes the stories? Um, you know, is it a family story that we don't know for sure is true, right? So how do I prove or disprove that if I don't know where I got it from? The other part of that is organizing your research. It's important to try to organize your research, both print and digital. Um, I'm a paper person. I don't know if it's because I'm an attorney or not, but I love paper. So I do have a couple of binders full of information here in my apartment in Santa Monica uh, for my family. But I still need to organize that. In the toolkit, I give a, a kind of a brief description of a way that I've done that digitally. And you can look at what works best for you. But remember, the research process is repeatable, that you need to organize your research and to always, always cite your sources. So United States Immigration and Naturalization. Today, we're just gonna cover, or tonight, we're just gonna cover a kind of a tip of the iceberg of the records that are available and focusing primarily on two record sets, passenger list and naturalization records. Now passenger lists are going to be something also, you, they may be called ship manifest. These are gonna be records of individuals arriving in the United States. The passenger list uh, could be from either they're arriving in the port of New York um, or other places. It will include information about the individual, and I'll get into some of that in the next slide. Uh, you know, sort of their, where they uh, departed, their arrival in the U.S., um, maybe who they were traveling with as well. And then you'll have naturalization records. One of the things about most individuals that immigrated to the United States is that they were on the path to citizenship. And to be on the path to citizenship is to go down the naturalization process. There are many resources available online. You will hear me reference familysearch.org. It's a free website. Family Search has a lot of information. It's very rich in information. And Family Search has records or at least information about records from around the world. And then there's also ancestry.com, which is a subscription-based site. So that means there's a fee associated with it. And I've been able to find records for some of my clients or other work that I've done um, with the Liberty Ellis Foundation website. Now it's a free website. However, you do need to create an account. And if you want a copy of a ship photo, I believe, or a certificate or something like that, there's a fee associated with that. So if you're trying to figure out how to find information on your ancestors that immigrated to the United States, the first question is, when did they arrive? in the US. So we're gonna search those passenger lists online and we're gonna look for their arrival date. Once we find the passenger list, you wanna note 
the date that they arrived, the port that they arrived in, the name of the ship as well. And also when you get the name of the ship, look at local newspapers, local meaning newspapers in the port where they arrived. We're gonna focus today or tonight on New York. So look at newspapers in New York. They may have information about the ship. Um, you know, it was a big story when it arrived, depending on when the ship arrived. And they also may have photos of that as well. Here's an example of some of the information you can get from a passenger list. This is for a gentleman named Norman Butterfield. I am not related to Norman. Um, he just happens to be one of the folks that I, or the person I chose on this journey uh, with me tonight to talk to you about immigration records. And Norman arrived, um, he left Hamilton, Bermuda on May 16th, 1907. He arrived in New York on May 19th, 1907. And he was age 21. This gives you information about his port of arrival, as I talked about. But the three things that I bullet pointed at the bottom are what's really important to me on this record. Now, a passenger list or passenger record may be, have many columns. I believe this particular um, passenger list had about 23 columns. So I chose the things that I felt were useful for this conversation and useful in understanding more about Norman. So I know that he came on the ship, the Pretoria or the SS Pretoria and that Norman was traveling with his cousin who was also 21. I mean, as a genealogist, uh, you know, sometimes we do the genealogy happy dance. I must admit, I was very excited to see this because with Norman, you know, I had never seen this before in a passenger record. And I believe they noted that Norman, uh, that they were both 20, because they were both 21, that they were cousins and not brothers or twins. And then the other point is that they were traveling to meet their aunt, Mrs. Alice Reed, who was already living in New York City. So if you don't know that um, that there was already already a relative in New York, or you don't know why your ancestor actually went to New York, now you have the information. Their date of departure, date of arrival, as well as who they were traveling with, and what relatives they were meeting. And yet I just have to say, because someone's put into the chat, uh, that Juna Jeffers, uh, she's with us. She said that she's got a family connection to Norman Butterfield. Which I knew would I feel happen. Like I, I feel like I'm on like wheel of fortune. Like all of a sudden, you know, here we have, here's your one example that's coming up. And how great is that? How great is it? That's why I was doing the genealogy happy dance. I knew Norman wanted to be found. So I'm excited <laughs> that there's someone on tonight that can, uh, that's learning a bit more about him. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing. I, I think you might need to actually trademark genealogy happy dance. <laughs> I might need to. Thank you. So this is what we know about Norman. We're going to learn a little bit more about Norman. So I'm excited that someone has a connection is on tonight. So now that we know that Norman arrived in the US, that he came with his cousin and that his aunt is already living here. Our next question is going to be, well, did Norman become a naturalized citizen or did your ancestor become a naturalized citizen of the United States? When you're doing research in the US, there are several census records that identify immigration and naturalization years. I'm focusing on 1930 and 1940 for the purposes of this presentation. However, we know Norman arrived in 1907, so he should be enumerated in 1910, 1920, as well as 1930 and 40, barring anything happening to him or him coming back home. So in 1930, I searched in the census for Norman and I found him. Now in the certain co in the columns listed, they will say immigration to the United States. So what year did he arrive? We know that Norman arrived um, in 1907 because we got that from the passenger list. Then it would say, well, was he naturalized? I know that Norman was not naturalized in 1930. So I look in the 1940 census. Now, column 16 is important because you see there are three different categories we have here. Alien, AL, 
PA for having first papers and NA for naturalized. You will see in the toolkit, I included a list of some key legislation for immigration into United States. So key laws impacting immigration into the US. This is important because depending on when your ancestor actually immigrated to the United States, they will be impacted by this changing legislation, right? So in 1940, we had the 1940 Alien Registration Act. I won't go into detail now about that. Again, reference the toolkit. But what's important is in 1940, Norman had the letters in column 16, PA. And for Norman, that means having first papers. So having first papers means that Norman had a declaration of intention. So Norman decided that he was on the path to citizenship. He had filed a declaration of intention to become a citizen of the United States. What I love about this document is you get so much information about him. For his relative who's on, who's on the call tonight or part of the Zoom tonight, you get the address where he lived in New York City, what his occupation was. You get a physical description of Norman. Um, also his birth date, which is something that you may not have known previously. Who he married. His wife, so his wife's name, when she was born, when they were married, uh, where she was born. And then you also get to confirm here the information of the ship. So with, we know from the passenger list that he came on the SS Pretoria, but this document verifies that. And his arrival date of May 19th, 1907. And then we get to see Norman's handwriting. Now, Norman filed this declaration of intent, of intention in 1936. So that's why we see in 1930, he's not naturalized, but in 1936, he has, or excuse me, 1940, he has his first papers because he filed this declaration of intention. So the next question is, if I'm searching for Norman or you're searching for your ancestor, is to really determine, well, did he actually go through with becoming naturalized? So the way to find that information, once you search these records that are available on Ancestry, you know, this is an example of some of the records that are available, but also uh, records related to immigration and naturalization are available on familysearch.org as well. The next step is to contact uh, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services or UCIS genealogy program. I put the uh, web address here for you guys because this process is shifting or shifts sometimes I would say. And the issue we have is just for example, on the previous administration, this particular program was in jeopardy of increasing its fees. So with Norman, I have his declaration of intention. What I didn't mention is on that slide, or excuse me, in that document, the top right, you couldn't see it was a file number, right? A number attached to, to Norman with a file number. And if you wanted to request Norman's naturalization file, you would have to go through this process. So as you can see on this slide, if you have the file number, they'll give you some guidance, but you can request a copy of his file. If you do not have the file number, they can do a search of their index for you, give you the response, and then you may be able to get a copy of the file then. I mentioned this in the uh, toolkit that some of the records were destroyed. Um, in the 1950s. This process um, requires a little bit more detailed research. And what I mean by that is with the US, USCIS genealogy program, they have a frequent, an FAQ, excuse me, an FAQ that you can use that's updated. That FAQ lets you know if there have been any changes in the fees, any changes in the process. Um, any laws or anything that have been passed to impact your ability to get your ancestor's record.
But this would be the logical next step if you want to figure out if Norman actually went through with the citizenship process and then getting copies of those files. And that will be for any of your ancestors. Now- I was just gonna jump in to say FAQ stands for frequently asked questions. Thank you. Don't wanna make any assumptions. Yes, for frequently asked questions, thank you. Now, this process is different um, depending on when they arrived and the process could be different for pre-1906 um, immigration into the United States as well. But for most people, this is where you would kind of end up and getting copies of those records. So to kind of recap what we've learned so far, we've gone through the process of trying to figure out when our ancestor arrived. Once we got that information by searching the passenger list, by getting the name of the ship, by finding the port of arrival, when we've done that, the next step is to determine the path to citizenship. Did they want to become a citizen? Were they naturalized? We've gotten Norman's Declaration of Attention that was filed in 1936. So now we're moving to the step of getting his naturalization record. And that's where we are here. But once you get all of this information, once you find this out, right, what are you going to do with it? Why is it important? Getting back to the steps we talked about in doing genealogy and understanding what your goal is here. And that's where we get to the point of sharing your story. So it's important to think about how you want your story to be told. This is critical. Because looking at that document, looking at these passenger lists, these individuals are names, dates, and places on a piece of paper. But how do you put them in historical context? And one of the ways to do that is to understand the importance of storytelling. Telling your story, your ancestor's story, really connects you to the past. It really gives you a sense of understanding who they are. I love, love, love that we have someone who has a connection to Norman because Norman's story whether she knew it or not, is being told today in a very small piece. But just by me bringing out that document, me bringing out that slide with the passenger list, right? Norman's now being kind of semi-famous tonight and getting his story and his journey shared. And this brings him to life. In doing this research and prepping for this, I got to know Norman. In my own mind, you know, I have a whole big post-it note with Norman's information on it because I really wanted to, to make sure that his, his journey came across, right? And imagine if this was your ancestor. Imagine if this is the person whose story you were telling, where you started from collecting that information and now you're able to share it with everyone. You're able to write that article. You're able to share it with the family over a Zoom or at a dinner or wherever else. But also think about your own story. Who do you want to tell your story? And really, how do you want them to tell your story? You want to make sure it's best that you tell your story before someone else does. And what I mean by that is they're not going to present the same type of information that you want to present in your story. What may be important to them, it may not, is not important to you or may not be important to you. But what you can do today is use some of those questions that I referenced earlier that you could use in interviewing to tell your story, to start that journey, to help you as you began your genealogy journey and look to this presentation and to Norman as an example of what you can do with your ancestor story. And this is what I loved about being a part of Genealogy Roadshow, is I was able to sit in front of someone and tell their story and put them in historical context and share that with their relatives. So what does it mean to tell a great story? Well, you got to start with who's my audience? 
What message do I wanna share? And then what events do you wanna share? What are the most compelling? We would always say that genealogy, or at least I let me change that, <laughs> the producers would say genealogy and television don't mix because genealogists, we love to research. You want to research for months and months and months at a time, right? It's like a, you know, it's a it's like a rabbit hole of stuff. TV, they want it done quick so they can create the story. And but what events do you want to share so that you create this story? that's digestible by others, right? That other people want to know, they want to learn. When you tell a great story, that's something people will repeat. So what are those most compelling events in your life or in Norman's life, or if you have your own ancestor's life that you want to share? And then you want to find those stories. What lessons did they learn? What events did, or lessons did you even learn or what events did you witness? I mean, for me personally, I never thought that I'd be in, you know, involved in a global pandemic. I never thought I'd be home for almost a year in Santa Monica. Um, I, I mean, we all have our stories of what 2020 was like, you know, so that's a major event that we have all witnessed together. But also in telling a great story is to highlight a struggle, highlight a triumph. Right, people want to see you overcome something. And in telling the story of your immigrant ancestor and telling the story of Norman who left Bermuda, who decided to come to the United States, who decided to go on a path of citizenship. This is just a brief kind of bookend or not even that much of his story. There's so many other pieces that went into it to kind of thread to how he got to 1940, how he got to this Declaration of Intention in 1936. But in telling that story and your story and your ancestor's story, you wanna make sure that you keep it simple, right? We always want to, well, we will always kind of share more about our story or our family, especially when we're talking about family history. But to keep people engaged, I think it's really important to keep it simple. So now, hopefully, everyone's wondering, well, what happened to Norman? What else went on? Why did he come to the US? Was it because of his aunt? Why did his cousin come with him? What did they do before they came to the US? All of those questions, all of those things, can be answered through documents, through genealogy research, and all of those components can be put together to tell a great story, to not only tell Norman's story, but also tell your story. So hopefully tonight you've been inspired to go home and to write down your story. So thank you. Well, thank you. I, we've been seeing all kinds of questions come through and um, I feel connected to Norman. I love seeing his signature. And, you know, when you do see, when you have that relic of the living person, it's like the signature on a piece of artwork. It's, you know, the, there's the hand um, mm -hmm. and it's a reminder um, of that sort of that very physical connection. So uh, there are several questions uh, there and two that kind of are connected. Um, what about the ship arrivals pre-1800, particularly the, the, those ships arriving as a part of, of the um, industry of enslavement? Mm. Um, how do people go about those records? Or, and duo, how do people go about those records pre-1800 on registered uh, vessels? Um, yeah, if you could speak to those questions, that'd be terrific. Sure. Um, so let me take, I guess, the, I'll take the second one first, I guess, sort of the pre-1800 or um, that are not uh, enslaved vessels, right? Or that um, a lot of what you, a lot of immigration records as it relates to coming to the United States requires you to understand the immigration law. So I believe in the uh, toolkit, our first immigration law was in 1790-ish. Don't quote me on that because I don't have it right in front of me. But what you would need to do is understand um, the laws around immigration at that time. 
Then once you do that, what I would suggest is going to the Family Search Wiki. So you go to familysearch.org and then you would go, you would click at the top, there's a button that says search. And then I believe it's at the bottom, it says research wiki. And the research wiki, um, I would type in just immigration uh, records or immigration, it will come up with a page of resources and it will give you a list of resources and documentation or documents that are available by time periods. And that, and I would search for kind of that pre 1800 um, as, as a first start. I do discuss this in my book, The Family Tree Toolkit, um, because it depends on sort of, you know, why and how your ancestor got here. Um, so I would say family search wiki, see what's available online, understand the laws. I'm always, not just because I'm an attorney, but I will always say no matter what, I will always go back to understanding the laws. You have to understand the laws, especially as it relates to immigration, because the United States constantly changes it, even today. The second part, or the first question, but I'm answering second, regarding the enslaved um, that came to the US. Um, that's a difficult one, it's tricky. There are some databases that have been created. Um, one, it, and they track kind of vessels of the transatlantic slave trade. One is called enslaved.org, I believe. Um, but it goes back to that second question. What are you trying to find out about your family? If you're trying to figure out if you can identify the vessel or the ship, excuse me, the ship that your enslaved ancestor came on uh, or was forcibly migrated to the United States, that's gonna be a bit more challenging. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's definitely gonna be a bit more challenging. For that, I would look at enslaved.org as one um, resource. I know that Michigan State University has a project that they're doing on that as well. They might've combined the two. But I would, I would think that that's kind of the alt, in my opinion, other genealogists may disagree with me. I think that's kind of an ultimate goal, right? That's like, if I could get as far back as possible, if I could get my genealogy gold, that would be it, right? Um, but understand, also understand the number of um, ships that actually came to uh, the United States. I mean, just from, the, and I'm not going to get too technical and move over, move to the next question, but the number of Africans that came to the U.S. Um, that were, you know, forcibly removed to the U.S. is less than a half a million, right? And then we also know that they came from, there were others that came from different other places, right? They came from other places uh, with, within the uh, British Empire as well. You would need to understand more about the history of the importation of slaves, um, which the ban of importation of slaves went into effect in uh, 1808. So understand that. And then the, the history of, I know that a number of enslaved individuals came into the ports into Charleston. I believe almost 40%-ish came into Charleston, South Carolina as well. I hope that answered the question. I was kind of well, all of these questions really almost become topics for other um, presentations. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll surface and do it as as much as we can in the time that we have. Um, then another question is um, about we're talking about sort of thinking about these passenger lists. What about those family members who were stateside who came to Bermuda? Yeah, so they do have. Um, so a couple of things with the passenger list, right? So um, there are some in, there are some lists for both outbound and inbound, right? Um, passenger lists. There are also um, list of let's say for example, um, you know, I, I just because I'm talking about him, but I, Norman is an example, right? I know that he went back and forth, right? There's times where he came after he got to the U.S. He went back to Bermuda. He went other places. So um, those lists do exist. The way to find which the most updated resources, because Ancestry.com, as well as um, um, FamilySearch.org, they are always updating their collections. 
right? So for example, my book came out in 2018. I think probably as soon as it, you know, hit the bookstore or Amazon or whatever, a lot of those links and resources had been updated. So see what they're digitizing and indexing. Another great resource to uh, is National Archives. So National Archives and Records Administration, they will uh, let you know what records are on microfilm and then what has been digitized and with the and then the um, who the partner is. And the partner would typically be Family Search, Ancestry, or someone like My Heritage, um, or Find My Past is another company as well. And each of the passenger list. Um, are going to be different based on um, not each of the or the information collected may be different based on the laws of the time, right? So all of those forms that are including your toolkit from the National Archives are going to be based on you know maybe someone is February 1907 versus May of 1907, right? There's a different form that was used to collect the information of those coming in as well as some of those that are going out. So sort of on the same line in terms of migration, what about um, Native, Native American records? Uh, there's one um, individual here who's saying that her family member um, moved from Bermuda to a Native American reservation. Mm -hmm. Are those the same locations of sourcing you're, you're mentioning now? Um, that's a bit tricky because uh, I have a lot of follow-up questions, right? The first question is always going to be the time frame. When did this happen, right? So when did they immigrate to the U.S.? How do you know they immigrated and moved to a Native American um, reservation, right? Um, and where exactly did they did they go in the U.S.? I mean, um, you can look at the National Archives and look on the Native American uh, record set. But that would require a lot more information to kind of figure out, to pinpoint exactly the time period, because I'm not as familiar with that. But just off the top of my head, those would be the questions that I would come back to the person. Um, a question that has come through the chat that you and I talked about previous to this um, was about the family members who don't necessarily want to release information. What does one do about that? Um, it's a tough one, I would say. Um, my grandfather um, and my mother kind of gets upset when I talk about this, but my grandfather is 94. My last name is Barry. It's the Barry side of the family. He is very, very tight-lipped and will not give a lot of information. So um, I think one of the ways to do it is as I've, as I've done with him, right? You know, I'm on TV, I speak, I say to him, you know, I'm just trying to find our people, right? Um, I'm not trying to give out our family business. Um, I'm not gonna plaster it all over the internet somewhere, but it's to really kind of connect with them and say, I just wanna know where I came from. I'm not looking to take this information, information and use it against anyone. I'm not looking to take this information and, um, you know, write some tell-all book, right? But the other thing that I would say is it's important for medical information, right? Tell me, just give me names, give me dates, tell me some stories. Because if I can find these people, is there something in our family history, family health history that may impact me? Most of the time when you go visit, visit the doctor, they're going to ask you about your family health history. So I think this is really um a good way to kind of get them to say, okay, you know what? She's doing this research or he's doing this research for the benefit and not to try and something to, to document something negative about us. I've tried that. I will say my grandfather has over the years loosened up. A lot of times he'll just start talking without me even prompting him. And I think that's because over the year, you know, he's been conditioned that I'm not gonna take this information and do something um, with it. Now, I will say when you're doing research and you discover sensitive information, you have to make a decision as a researcher whether or not you are actually, I think you have to make a decision as a researcher to either tell someone that information, maybe it's someone close to you, your genealogy buddy that's a family member or not. And then if you will keep that information hidden. And what I, and, and by that, 
For example, if, if you find out something about a family member or there's a family story and that person's known that for, you know, that's been a thing they thought about for like 20, uh, you know, 20 years. So this is something, this was the family story and you find out that it's not, is it really worth it to tell them if they're in their 80s or 90s or whatever that no, this isn't true? I mean, who will it benefit in that sense? If it's not something that is, detrimental right you know oh they thought that such and such graduated from you know Morehouse College and actually they did not I mean that's not a big deal so it's not you know I mean it's just certain information you have to really think about if you want to share or not and then and what the end result will be and is it worth it that's a good point um, I'm just going to pause to make sure that the survey is made available in the chat. I do see that some people are, are, um, are going off and that's fine. Uh, of course, everyone's got lots to do. So I do wanna encourage everyone please to make sure they, um, they give us some, uh, some feedback. Um, so please go ahead with uh, that. Thank you, Deb. Um, another question from, um, from a well-known researcher on, and uh, community specialist on island, Jolene Bean. She's asking for you please to speak a little bit about the difference between genealogy and family history. Yeah, so with genealogy, um, when I think of genealogy, it's kind of the, the study of, um, at, well, in my opinion, we use it interchangeably, but for me, I think of genealogy kind of as the, the field of study of kind of, you know, of I'm going to look for my ancestors or as a professional genealogist, I'm gonna help a client look for their ancestors, right? When I look at family history, I think of family history, I think of it as more of a story or more of a, I'm trying to figure out the family history of a particular area or location. Um, and, not that studying family history is not professional, but I think in genealogy, there's more of a methodology, a discipline associated with it. There's the research method. You become a board a certified genealogist. You can do all of that. And when you think of family history, I think of something that's a little bit more um, of a casual thing. And a little bit more, I'm gonna do the family history of uh, you know this particular area uh, or this group. That's kind of what I think of. I hope that answered her question. But I know in the US, we use it interchangeably a lot. Um, one of the questions that you and I talked about before was about additional resources that might be available regarding American uh, research in general. Yeah, so I think it's some additional resources that we can look at for um, American research, again, is the National Archives. Um, you can look at the familysearch.org additional resources. There are a lot of things. When you're doing this research, we talked about the connection with Norman. That's just the immigration and naturalization records on these passenger lists, right? We got his uh, date of birth, right, information, but we may want to know when he when he um, died or his marriage records. Those are going to be what we call vital records. So those are going to be your birth, marriage, death records that are available at the state level, that are available um, sometimes at the county level, um, and those are going to be online in uh, state archives, what we call it in the archives or historical um, societies as well as genealogical societies. Other resources I like to look at are universities um, as well, their manuscript collections. And then if you want a big resource for me is really understanding the history, really understanding the history of the United States and the area that you're looking at, uh, that you're researching where your ancestor immigrated. Also, a really uh, good resource is the Library of Congress. So the Library of Congress is uh, has a wealth of photographs, um, a wealth of maps. They have a very nice digital collection that is actually online as well, um, which could be useful in doing this research. When it comes to genealogy, you know, I went through a lot of information. We, we did a little bit with Norman, but when I talked about the repeatable process and with genealogy and going down the rabbit hole, we laser focused on just immigration and naturalization, but that's one part of someone's life, right? When you realize and you decide you want to do genealogy, 
you know, you're going to, you're going to look at various segments of someone's life. Like you look at the segments of your own life, your, you know, information around, you know, about your birth and your childhood, your marriage, you know, your career, your travel, different things that you've done. As I said, in writing your own story, all of that requires you to take to do to do research and gather resources and gather documents to tell that story. And so as you get to these different process uh, pieces of the process and different points in the research, there'll be various resources that you'll look at that'll point you in each direction. And that's why you have to organize that research. That's why you have to keep track of who you interview. That's why you have to cite your sources, right? There's a wealth of information for, for excuse me, for American genealogy um, online, but you have to know kind of where to go and what, and what you're looking for and why you're looking for it, right? Which is what I talked about earlier. Which is you've just validated the purpose of this program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for endorsing this space. <laughs> No, but very seriously, I mean, this is what is going to be um, an interesting learning arc for all of us involved on the staff as we receive these questions and reference them back out, whether it's to you or to other panelists who've, uh, mm -hmm. who are assisting through the year. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. We're just getting to a wrapping up. I wanted to know, uh, Kenyatta, if you can just push to the next slide, um, oh, yeah. because I, I, yes, so that's, um, I'll just leave that for one minute. Just to point out though, before you branch off everybody, um, is that you do wanna be registered uh, for the next uh, events. So, okay, so let me just slow down. So first of all, I wanna thank um, thank the, the community of, of patrons that we have, and we're so fortunate to be able to offer this. And I do want to make another plug for membership with the museum and financial support. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the encouragement as well to pass along that this has transpired, it will live on the National Museum website, and it will be going to the National Museum website, nmb.bm, that will be the place for you to register for the next two events. We have registration open for the uh, event where we look at local resources in, oh my gosh, where are we, March? And then we go uh, into an interesting discussion on objects and storytelling in April with the Smithsonian Institute. So if I can just ask you to please go to the next slide. Perfect. So this is, this is my encouragement for everybody to click uh, onto the form and to give us some feedback. It only takes a few moments. Um, but without the feedback, we really don't understand necessarily how useful um, we have been to you and to your journey and, um, and that the survey will enable us to uh, perhaps craft something even better for next time or be aware of something that we, we should have been. So please uh, exercise your, your voice. Yeah. So um, Kenyatta, mm -hmm. I think this is fabulous. I, I, it's exactly as I had hoped in terms of being a tight presentation. We've entertained a lot of questions. I hope that everyone's been able to follow along with the chat. I've been watching a little bit of some of the posting. A lot of resources have been shared. Good. And so um, I, we, we, I really, we as a team really hope that um, we've been able to deliver on our overall goal which is to encourage your personal exploration of yourself and of your family, and then ultimately be working towards how are you going to honor and preserve that? And like you said, you know, crafting it into a story, um, something simple, uh, something impactful and meaningful, and, and making sure that it's been sensitively approached uh, so that uh, everyone who reads it is going to feel like your grandfather, uh, full of trust and, um, and happy to keep sharing their, their very personal stories. So thank you very much, um, Kenyatta. Um, if there aren't any other comments from the National Museum team, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us today. The, uh, your website has been posted in the chat group. It's your name, Kenyatta Berry. And, uh, and I hope that um, we'll be able to engage you further as we go along this journey with our community. Thank you so much for having me. You're so very welcome.